All right, let's talk about springs. All right, if we look at springs, the, governed, the force of a spring is governed by Hooke's law, F equals negative kx. Technically, this should be negative k delta x. It's related to the displacement. You displace the spring away from the equilibrium position. So, but a lot of people just shorten it down to f equals negative kx, a lot of textbooks as well, including yours. Uh, in this case, if you look, the equilibrium position is the position of a spring, where if I was, say, holding a spring, and if I let it go, it doesn't go anywhere. It just sits right there. Whereas if I compress a spring and let it go, where's it going to go? It's going to go the opposite direction. If I extend a spring and let it go, it's going to snap back the other way. But at the equilibrium position, that's the place where if I let it go, it's not going anywhere, which means there's no net what? No net force acting at the equilibrium position. So that's where your force is zero, your net force. And if your net force is zero, then what's also zero? Your acceleration is also zero. <clears throat> cool, if you look at where this thing is maximally compressed, so let's say I compress this spring and I let it go. It's gonna spring through, it's gonna pass through the equilibrium position and keep going till it's maximally extended. And then it's gonna snap back and just go back and forth. So if we look at the point of maximum compression, maximum extension, so, well, they're also the points of maximum displacement, which means what's true? That's where you're at the maximum force as well. Let's talk about this for a minute. It's not F equals KX, it's F equals negative KX. What's the whole negative thing here? Well, force is a vector, which means direction matters. So if I push and compress this thing to the left, my displacement's to the left, which weighs the force of the spring point? To the right. To the right. So this force is the force of the spring. Notice, it's not me applying a force and compressing it, it's the force the spring pushes back. If you actually talk about the force of compressing the spring, then you could just say F equals KX, because then the force and the displacement would be in the same direction. But the force in F equals negative KX is always the force generated by the spring. Cool. So in this case, at maximum compression or maximum extension, that's where your force is at a maximum. And if your force is at a maximum, what's also at a maximum? According to Newton's second law. Yeah. So just imagine this thing oscillating back and forth for a minute. So think about it. It's throwing up a marker in the air again. So where does the velocity of that marker hit zero? At its apex, right when it's changing directions. So its velocity in one direction, we could say it's positive, negative in the other. Same thing with throwing the marker up. It's positive on the way up, negative on the way down, right in between, it's where it's zero. So the same thing here, whenever something changes direction, that's where its velocity is gonna be zero for a split moment here. Where's the velocity zero? Yeah, so max compression, max extension, right as it's changing direction, that's where its velocity is zero. And if its velocity is zero, what kind of energy does it not have at those points? No kinetic energy. Now the potential energy of a spring, so it's not gravitational in this case, it's elastic potential energy now. So, and in this case with elastic potential energy, so it's related to having a displacement. Now, where do we have no displacement? equilibrium position, which is why we had no force as well. In addition to having no force, we also have no elastic potential energy at that point. Okay, if this spring is not subject to any non-conservative forces, then we're gonna see the conservation of mechanical energy again. So, Let's just say um, that I told you at max compression here, this spring had 100 joules of energy. In this case, being at the point of max compression, it's all in the form of what kind of energy? Potential. Oh, so this is also the point where your displacement's the greatest, so your potential energy is also at a maximum. So if I compress this spring, say half a meter, and let it go, so it's potential energy at a maximum, max compression. How far past the equilibrium position do I think I should extend on the other side? Again, assuming conservation of mechanical energy. Half a meter, that way it gets 
back to having the same amount of potential energy, the same displacement required. So, where, if this thing has no potential energy at the equilibrium position, then what's true here about the kinetic energy? It's at a maximum. Anywhere along the point of the motion, if there's conservation of mechanical energy, what should be true? So in this example, yes. So if I start out with 100 joules of potential energy, then anywhere along the motion, whether it be at the max compression, max extension, equilibrium, or anything in between, we'd have a total of 100 joules. What's convenient, though, is at these three points, we only have one form of mechanical energy, and all 100 joules would be in that one form, either all potential here and here, or all kinetic here and here. So oftentimes, we give you a problem where we compress a spring or extend a spring and release it, and then ask you, what's the velocity as it passes through the equilibrium position? In fact, I believe that's the next question on your handout. No, not quite. We're getting there, though. Let's do seven before we do eight. So number seven. If a 200 newton force displaces a spring 10 centimeters from its equilibrium position, then what would be the displacement resulting from a 1,000 newton force? So in this case, we're told the applied force is 200 newtons, and we're told the displacement is 10 centimeters. And the question is then, what displacement will result from a 1,000 newton force? Now, there's a couple, couple different ways to approach this here. So I applied a 200 newton force and ended up with a 10 centimeter displacement. What can I calculate? K. K. What is K? Spring constant. It's the spring constant. A larger K value just means a stiffer spring. It takes more force to cause a displacement for a stiffer spring. You get a larger spring constant. So I do have enough info to actually calculate the spring constant if I want to. So, but we can also take another approach. How are force and displacement related according to Hooke's law here? They're directly proportional. And so in this case, a 200 newton force got me a displacement of 10 centimeters. So then a 1,000 newton force, well, how many times bigger is this than this? Five times bigger than what should be true about the displacement. It'd be five times bigger and 50 centimeters. So essentially, I'm just saying F1 over X1 equals F2 over X2, or vice versa. They're proportional. So, and we can say that. 200 newtons got me a displacement of 10 centimeters, so 1,000 newtons should get me a displacement of x. And we can solve for x. Same diff. So, but if you can see the relationship, you might save yourself a little bit of time on a calculation. Um, if you were going to okay, calculate the k, would it be negative? No. So if I was going to calculate the k, would it be negative? So let's go back and look. So if a 200 newton force generates a displacement of 10 centimeters, so let me ask you, I pushed, let's say I applied the force, 200 newtons. What was the force of the spring? 200. Negative 200 newtons, if you want to look at it that way. So the negatives are going to cancel one way or the other. You're like, well, we're going to put the negative k value if we don't account for that. But you're right, because the force I'm applying and the displacement actually point in the same direction. And I would lose that negative sign if I used that value. So keep in mind, that's a big difference if you're talking about the applied force or the force generated by the spring. So the F equation would always be the force that spring. Right. And so in this case, because I applied a 200 newton force in the same direction as the displacement, then if I make this a positive 10 centimeters, then this would be a negative yeah. 200 newtons. And the two negatives will cancel. The third law, so it's like yep, equal and opposite, yep, perfect. So by the way, if you were going to calculate the k value, what would you probably convert the displacement to? 0 0.1 meters, yeah. So spring constants are often given in newtons per meter. Spring with a spring constant of 800 newtons per meter. And a two kilogram mass on the end is stretched horizontally 20 centimeters from its equilibrium position on a frictionless surface and released. What is the velocity of the mass on the end of the spring as it passes through the equilibrium position? So this is exactly that situation we were just talking about. So in this case, I'm just gonna look at it this way. I stretched a spring 20 centimeters from its equilibrium position. So let's say here at this point, x equals 20 centimeters. So, and then 
two kilogram mass. Cool, and then I let it go. And this thing's just gonna oscillate back and forth, again, assuming no non-conservative forces. I'll well, tell this is a frictionless spring, or a frictionless surface with the mass anyways. Uh, and in this case, question is, what's the velocity of the mass on the end of the spring as it passes through this equilibrium position, where we have kinetic energy at a maximum, where there's no potential? So in this case, we'll just take advantage of the fact that there's conservation of mechanical energy again. So potential plus kinetic equals potential plus kinetic. Initial, initial, final, final. With initial being the point of maximum extension, the final being the equilibrium position. And so maximally extended, which one of these is zero? The kinetic. Good. And at the equilibrium position, which one's zero? Cool, and so the initial potential energy, one half kx squared equals the final kinetic energy, one half mv squared. Your halves cancel. And in this case, your velocity is gonna equal the square root of k over m, and square root of x squared is just x. And in this case, I shouldn't use a displacement of 20 centimeters. I should use? 0.2 meters. Awesome. 0 0.2 meters. And then all that is times the displacement. Uh, oh, that's mass. My bad. Here we go. There's my 0.2 meters. Mass on bottom. My bad. Cool. So in this case, what's 800 divided by 2? 400, what's the square root of 400? 20, what's 20 times a fifth? Great. And so the velocity passing through the equal position is four meters per second. Cool, I could ask you a slightly different question. How much mechanical energy would it have at any point along its motion? How much mechanical energy would it have at any point along its motion? Well, now that we know this, I can either just solve, say what the kinetic energy is then, or what the original potential energy was, and it should be that total at any point along its motion. So let me ask you one more question. So let's say I told you that the velocity of this lovely spring through the equilibrium position was only three meters per second. What could you conclude? Friction. friction or some other non-conservative force did work. And how would you calculate how much work that non-conservative force did? Yeah, you'd find the potential energy at max extension, you'd find the kinetic energy at equilibrium, and take the difference between the two to find out how much positive or negative work? Negative, negative work your non-conservative forces did. Cool.